What is up, guys? We're going to be taking a look at this lab, CSRF, where token is duplicated in Cookie. Now, in the CSRF examples we've seen so far, the cross-site request forgery prevention system involves a CSRF token and then ideally a link to the user's session in a backend database somewhere. This particular lab uses a slightly different flavor of cross-site request forgery protection. It's referred to as the double submit CSRF prevention technique. Now the guidelines say this lab attempts to use the insecure double submit CSRF prevention technique, which could be misleading because double submit is not inherently insecure. It can actually be implemented securely. It's just not implemented securely in this particular vulnerable lab. The key conceptual difference is that the cross-site request forgery token is not linked to the user session in a backend database somewhere. It's actually only linked to a second reference to the cross-site request forgery token stored in the header that's sent by the victim to the web app. This is predicated around the idea that the attacker can't arbitrarily set headers for the victim's browser. So even if the attacker were to somehow gain access to the victim's cross-site request forgery token, unless they can also manipulate the user's browser into sending the cross-site request forgery token in the header as well, then they don't have an attack vector. And this is why it's referred to as the double submit prevention technique, because the cross-site request forgery token has to be sent as part of the post request body and also a second copy of the CSRF token in the header. As you might already begin to sense from the previous lab, if we can find a way to arbitrarily inject values into the headers submitted by the victim's browser, then it's going to be possible to actually bypass the cross-site request forgery protection. Now, don't worry if it doesn't make sense so far. That's just the high-level overview of how this vulnerability works. Let's see it in action. Things will make a bit more sense. First of all, we're going to log into the account with the supplied credentials, Wiener, Peter. We're going to submit a change email request, and then we're going to explore the subsequent HTTP post request using BERT. So let's change the email to wiener at newemail.net. Choose update email. Here is a copy of the post request that we've sent to BERT repeater. First of all, notice in the post request body, we have the cross-site request forgery token and then submitted again in the header, we have this CSRF cookie and then we have the exact same CSRF value. Now, in this case, there's no need to store in a backend database a link between the CSRF token and the victim session. The idea here is that only the victim is prompted to set the CSRF token as one of the headers. So even if the attacker somehow gets hold of the CSRF token, it's not going to make a difference because he can't manipulate the user's browser also into sending the CSRF token as part of the cookie headers. Just to give you some proof of concept here that the web app does not care about the session, let's change the CSRF value to fake. Let's also change the value in the CSRF cookie to fake. Let's change to new email 2.net. Let's choose send. If we head to the account section, we can see that the email has been successfully changed to wiener at newemail2.net. So the only criteria is that the CSRF token in the post request body matches the CSRF token that's returned in the headers. As we mentioned earlier, this is all predicated around the idea that we can't arbitrarily set a header for the victim. But if the web app also has some sort of header injection vulnerability, now we can set arbitrary headers for the victim. So it's actually fairly trivial to ensure that the CSRF token submitted in the post request body exactly matches the CSRF token that's sent as part of the headers. Now, if you've watched the previous lab in the series, you'll know that this particular lab does have a header injection vulnerability, and we can exploit that vulnerability making use of the search functionality here. If we provide any arbitrary search term, you can see in the response we get from the web app, we have a set cookie header, last search term equals, followed by our search term. It's possible to inject into the headers at this point by making use of carriage return characters and injecting an entirely new set cookie header. And obviously what we're looking to inject is the cross-site request forgery token 
and its value that's going to match the CSRF token we're going to use as part of the post request body. Again, you can see a slightly more in-depth example of the header injection in the previous lab in this series. So conceptually, we have all of the information that's required now to craft our attack. So we've headed to the exploit server. The guidelines recommend that we start out with the HTML snippet that's included in the CSRF with no defenses lab. Now it's going to require some modification. First of all, we're going to change the email value to anything at. So the URL encoded at is going to break the functionality of this cross-site request forgery attack. We then need to provide our lab ID. So we can copy this from the URL bar. We could then replace the your lab ID constant with our lab ID. We'll now provide a second hidden input field with our CSRF token. So input type equals hidden name equals CSRF value equals fake. We just need to make sure this is going to match up with the CSRF token that we provide. So long as the CSRF token in the header is also named fake, then it's going to be accepted as valid. Instead of the self submitting form, we first of all need to convince the web app to send the victim a set cookie header so that the victim is going to have the CSRF token in the header with the value of fake. So instead of the script tags, we're going to be making use of image tags. Let's copy this back in the exploit server. Let's remove everything to do with the script tags. We're now going to paste image source. Notice that it is going to be making use of carriage return characters to create the injection. It's then going to have set cookie and it's going to set the value of the cookie as CSRF equals fake. Therefore, it's going to be matching up with the CSRF we're sending in the post request body. Now we do need to provide our lab ID for the image source as well. So we're going to replace the your lab ID constant with our lab ID. So this is going to convince the user's browser to set the CSRF equals fake as part of the cookie header. And then on error, it's going to call document.forms at index zero submit. It's going to submit this form at which point the CSRF token in the post request body and the CSRF token submitted as part of the header is going to match. Therefore, it's going to be valid regardless of the victim's session cookie. So let's choose store. Let's choose deliver exploit to victim and we get the message, congratulations, you solved the lab. Now, in terms of mitigation here, the solution is not necessarily to avoid the double submit CSRF prevention technique. We could maybe get that impression from the lab guidelines, which seem to imply that using double submit is insecure. It's possible to implement this securely. It's just that it's just that if your web app also has a header injection vulnerability, then it's possible to completely bypass this double submit CSRF prevention technique. It seems probably safer and more straightforward to simply make sure that the CSRF token is always tied to the session token. It's a lot harder to bypass and there's no reason why you couldn't implement both. We could have the CSRF token linked to the user, but also require the user to submit the CSRF token both in the header and as part of the post request body. Now, although this is possible and potentially increases security. It's not done in the majority of cases because it's generally considered redundant. If you have your CSRF token correctly linked to the session, that's sufficient security in most cases. Or if you have an effectively implemented double submit CSRF prevention technique, then you actually don't need to link the CSRF token to the session. Both of these are secure approaches in themselves. So while you could argue that combining them could potentially increase security, it's also considered redundant in the majority of cases because each approach on its own is sufficient as a CSRF prevention mechanism. It's interesting, however, to note in the case of this lab that if the web app developer had doubled up and used CSRF token tied to the session, then the fact that we'd found a header injection vulnerability wouldn't be enough in itself to activate this specific cross-site request forgery attack vector. So in the case of having a web app that could have some vulnerabilities that have gone unpatched, you could argue that doubling up is going to increase the security, but as mentioned, it's considered redundant to double up in most cases. All right, hope it was interesting. Thanks very much for checking out the content and I look forward to catching you guys in the next lab.